Um, Lindley, uh, I forgot to, Sandy Levesque brought some photos um, of the potholes and stuff. She took some photos with the ruler and stuff so you could see some dimensions and things. So, just, okay. just okay. so. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure that you um, knew what. So, but every so, Jean and Chris and Dave and Denise got to look at them. So, it was nice of her to do. All right. We'll call the meeting to order. And first on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Is there any amendments to the agenda this evening or? Not that I have, no. Okay, just need a motion to approve the agenda as written. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And we have one appointment this evening. So Sandy um, has made an appointment to talk about some Gilead Road issues. So this is. You, of yeah, course, yeah. yeah thank you, you don't for have to stand up or anything. Yeah. No. Okay. Thank you, Therese, for getting me, uh, inviting me to be on the Oh, schedule. sure, of course. I brought some friends. Good. <laughs> good, good, good. And uh, including our guest, Ben and Joanne, who arrived about an hour ago from San Fe, New Mexico, to see the <coughs> uh, Oh, yeah, hopefully you're our, not freezing. Uh, it's, a it's a holiday. Again, so some of our neighbors are away or entertaining guests. Sure. Um, uh, Friday morning, I found a packet of envelopes, which I, uh, photos rather, that I gave to you. And they were taken by uh, my neighbors, Lisa and Waddell. And they took it upon themselves to walk the road, count the potholes, measure them, and take photographs. And in that one mile stretch of pavement on Gillian Brook Road, they counted over 270 potholes. And those were, all of those were at least three inches deep. You'll see in the photograph. Please sign in. Some of the potholes are seven, were seven and eight inches deep. That afternoon, Friday afternoon, this past Friday afternoon, the town crew came and filled in some of the larger potholes, a good number of them. It's, mu it's much better, but there are still a lot of potholes left and a lot of work to do. Um, so I, I have a couple of, I have three issues really I want to discuss. Number one, the potholes. Uh, number two, the overall unacceptable condition of Gilead Brook Road. And number three, how, how the process works going forward, how the decision is made about what, what to do next on our road. So the potholes, um, I hope that you have all come to Gilead Brook Road and driven on it so you can experience what we have for months and with months of communication to the town hall as well. Uh, it's a dangerous situation in that you have to swerve. You have to do this dance in your vehicle to get beyond the potholes. And you're often approached by another vehicle trying to do the same thing or, and someone else behind you. If you don't do that, you lose uh, air pressure in your tires. Most of us go get that done regularly and or you get a flat tire. Uh, it is so dangerous that, as a pedestrian, um, I'm particularly concerned. Stephen and I walk Gilead Brook Road almost every day. And last week, one of our close friends, neighbor, was approaching us in his car, and he was doing the dance to get around the potholes, and he kept coming at us, and I thought, surely he's going to stop, but he didn't because he was paying attention to the potholes. We jumped over the shoulder, down over the bank, and saved our lives. And he apologized profusely. It wasn't his fault. He was just trying to save his vehicle. Gilead is a, a pretty country road. And it has easy access from Route 12. So we get people who come and park their car at the beginning of the road, or in my driveway, ask permission just to walk 
just to walk on Gilead. We have cyclists who use it on a regular basis. They come up that route through Tatro Hill and, and down Gilead. And it's not just Gilead Road, McIntosh Hill comes into Gilead Brook Road. We have a fair amount of traffic. It's not a sleepy road. So, I use the term, the word unacceptable because it was a long time living with this. And we don't know how much longer we're going to live with this. So that's the other thing. As, as far back as when Carl Russell was on a select board, uh, the talk started about converting Gilead Brook Road to gravel or dirt. And that has been circulating for some time, and we hear it more and more. Uh, I bought our house, we bought our house in 1973, so I've lived on Gilead Brook Road for 50 years. In that time, I remember it being repaved once. I don't have the recall about when that was, but it was just one time. So clearly, with the amount of traffic on it over all these years, it's in the condition that it's in. So, I'm interested in the process. How are these decisions made? My understanding is that the select board has the authority for roads in this town. Am I correct? Yes. And I'm assuming that the chain of command is select board to town manager to road foreman. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So then, when you're looking at the town, I mean, number one, can you tell me how Gilead Road compares to other roads in Bethel? Currently, it's because of the flooding, obviously, we're missing. We, we were missing a chunk of Whittier, but I think that's been corrected. We're still missing a chunk of Cleveland Brook Road, which hopefully will be collect corrected in the next couple of weeks. But due to the flooding, it's, you know, you, for a while, you weren't at the bottom of the list. You know, I mean, your world wasn't the worst. I hate to say that, but it, it's true just because of after the flooding. But what I had said to you when I saw you um, on, um, on Gilead was that, yes, we talk internally. Hi, can you just sign in right there? Thank you. I think there's some more chairs back there. Um, we talked about it internally. A couple years ago, I worked with um, Jeff Gilman, and we did some work, some ditching to try to get the water off the road. He did a great job, and he did some culvert replacement and things like that. And I, One of the things is that the road base was never done to support paving. It was a thing, I don't know what year it was that it was paved originally, I never did find out, but I'm sure somebody knows who lives there, but it was a situation where I think at the time the state may have felt that paving was the way to go versus you know gravel roads. So they came in and they paved. You know, we wouldn't do that now. We would have, there'd be base, there'd be prep, we would do all the, you know, you'd do the culverts, you'd do this, you'd do that. So instead, they just came and paved. And so it's created this situation that you're living now because it was never done properly. And I do understand from speaking to another resident of Gilead that there was an overlay done, um, which is really just basically going in and kind of filling, fills in the potholes and kind of does a little shim overlay, but it doesn't last because the base isn't right. So what would need to happen to Gilead to make it right is that it would need to do to it what we did just did recently to Christian Hill, which is come in and they, I don't know the right term, I say like it's like rototilling, and they take in all the, you know, grind in all the material and they, they bring in the base, they make sure all the culverts are done, we ditch, we, you know, and then we come in and then we pave. And so I think that's, for to do the stretch of Gilead is just over a half a million dollars. And um, because Gilead is also a class three road, we don't qualify for a paving grant like we did on Christian Hill. So it becomes all out of pocket where we were able to get 200,000, it was 200,000 from the state to help with the cost of Christian Hill. So we kind of had broken it down um, Jeff Gilman, W.B. Rogers, you know, had done some work 
a couple of years ago to help get the water off the road in places so that we were limping along what we had. Um, so I, th I think that, like to paint the big picture, so um, I mean, we feel that everybody's road is important. So um, the challenge is I'm <laughs> the longest serving select board member, so, um, but that's only going on my eighth year. So there's many years prior to me. Um, you know, Therese, since I've been here, there's been three town managers. So there's different uh, administration changes that happen. There's different road foremen, you know, so you got to think of how many, how many pieces here. So the, the challenge that we've had, or that I've had since I've been on the board is we, for a very long period of time in this town, that's one of the reasons why I got on the board was we were so busy looking at our taxes, like how inexpensive can we make it for everybody in town to afford to be here, but we never did any futuristic looking. So we didn't look to say, you know, let's put a plan together for all our paved roads or our gravel roads or like we've been seeing the last three years here is our, our water infrastructure has got to the point where the state stepped in and said, if you don't do something, you're going to lose your water license. So there's been so many things over a long period of time that weren't done, and it was more because we were so short-term focused rather than long-term focus. And short-term focus is easy because we can put together, you know, the average select board member might only be here for three years, right? So it's very easy for us to put together a short-term fix because we may not be here for the long term. And, and very seldom do we look at the long-term fixes because, um, you know, we're probably never going to be here. So the, um, the challenge we've had in the last, since I've been here, is we're trying to get caught up with, like, for instance, water, water line jobs. For so long, we've been putting Band-Aids on things. Um, and, and what that is, it's a nice, beautiful fix, but it only lasts for a short period of time rather than do it right and, and let it last longer. So we've been trying in town, since I've been on the board, or, and Teresa's Excuse been here, is we've been trying to do the long-term fixes rather than the short-term. Yes, we're all going to um, enjoy maybe our road or, or that culvert we put in, but we're trying to do the long-term rather than just run around and put fires out in town. Um, the, the, the big, so we put these plans together of this, you know, the prioritizing of our roads, um, and usually what it is, the prioritizing of roads is only paved roads. So for so long, you'll have an engineering firm that'll come in and put together a paved road inventory, and they'll tell you, like, this one's in poor condition or this one's in good condition, and how many years can we get before we need to put money into those roads? One thing we learned is we never did one for gravel roads, and a majority of our roads are gravel roads in this town. So as a lot of you have probably seen, you drive on a gravel road, it's been graded, a thousand times and all the materials gone you see big rocks that are popping out so we've started the last couple of years of starting a gravel road inventory of you know x amount of years before we need to put new gravel on roads so we're trying to put the processes in place again so that we can be successful in the future um, but some of the other challenges we have is just like what happened in july which happened in the spring of 2019 which just about every four and a half years it happens in Bethel, is we get these events. So, um, and they cost a lot of money. So we're trying to balance the, 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 normal, um, the normal workings of the town with our budgets. We're trying to balance that with futuristic projects. Um, and when we're talking about the futuristic projects of towns, we're trying to see what is our best bang for our buck. So, can we get grant money from the state to do with this road? So like for instance, like we just finished up um, Christian Hill job, which had been a three year or so job planning to get a grant from the state so that then we have good match money so it's not 100% funded by the town. Um, and we've done likewise on phase one and two of the water line, as well as we're in the process of Sand Hill. So there's, there's a bunch of these. The challenge that we have sometimes with um, some of the other roads is they're not, they don't come with any type of grant opportunities. So those become 100% funded by the town, um, where some other ones might have grant opportunities. So what we do is we, or not we, yeah. Therese does a good job of just throwing, anytime a grant possibility comes out, she writes a grant for it. 
Um, and uh, we talked about it a little bit at town meeting day this year. And the last couple of years, we've been really, really fortunate to get a lot of grants for Bethel, big dollar grants. So like Sand Hill, we, um, you know, this, this, this was many beggings and, you know, we were able to get um, Bernie Sanders office to, to uh, give us $600,000 for that road. We were able to get the Christian Hill grant um, for anybody that knows in the, uh, there's a Pleasant Street sidewalk pedestrian grant that we're working on there. So we've been pretty lucky with getting these grants that offset so we don't have to have these big um, spikes on on uh, our tax rates. So we're trying to keep that a nice bell-shaped curve so we don't have to go ask for a bunch of money every couple of years. It might be helpful to talk about ERAF. Yeah. Like our disadvantage that we can't get a grant to fix Gilly Grove Road. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, it, 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 yeah. definitely, it definitely does not help <laughs> the situation of us prioritizing that road more because first we prioritize the grant road so can we get money to offset that so it's not hundred percent funded um, and and then and then we have a capital improvements fund that we add money into every year so that we can over the long term so let's say we're not going to do any paving in town this year but we still set aside say a hundred thousand dollars so that we can offset those grant opportunities when they arise but I do know about project management mm -hmm. and so when you have something that is big taxes your resources taxes your finances has a timeline on it one of the things you can do is break it down into pieces which is exactly what we did. That's why we had Jeff do some work to do the culverts, okay, to do right. some of this. Exactly. Right, what could we tackle? Well, You're right. So if, if you have to look at Gilly, if the whole expanse of it is one half million dollar project, would you say we'll do a third of it this year, a third in 2025, a third in 2026? Is that a possibility? I don't know. I'm not well, sure how to, if you would... How would it work when you cut and adhere? If it would, be, is there just yeah, smoother I mean, it, to do one? Because you don't want to get water under the. For the size of the project, it's best on on Gilead, anyways. It's best. It's a mile piece of road, so it's best to do the whole mile at, at a time. Um, but what can we do um, to get a, a, get ourselves in line? Be a bigger prior, priority. We don't uh, qualify for grant support. Right. I don't think there's anything. I mean, for example, like, and it's not, we're not saying never. I just can't tell you when right now, but I will tell you this. So we're, we just received, so my estimate is we're at about $1.3 million in damages from the July flood. So the town, because you did these great things, like you did um, change some zoning regulations. So we're on the hook for our ERAF, which is our share of what we get from FEMA. FEMA does not pay the whole boat. We pay 12.5% of the damages. So when we did this in, after the 2019 flood, um, what we did was we started budgeting for, you know, 40 plus thousand each year to pay our share of the ERAF off. Like we were all similar. I believe some of you were here um, when we talked about Pinello Bridge, um, which will happen to the tune of $1.1 million. And so that's going out. That will be constructed hopefully next season. So we've been saving and we finally have all of our ERAF paid off just now, like this fiscal year for 2019. So now we'll budget for to pay off this share of the ERAF. But one of the things that we are going to do this winter is to now in a way, and, and I hate to say this for anyone that was affected, but in a way the flood were ahead I, or it helped us because we did a lot of work in 2019. We did a lot of work or doing a lot of work now. And some of it is not the same areas that blew out. So what I, our goal is this <clears throat> winter, Chris, myself, um, Ryan Slack, Morgan, AJ, to look at the roads and say, okay, these are all the roads we fixed, touched, whatever, during 2019 and 2023, what's left. And then create a priority, which is obviously you know, Gilead, it's a priority to us. We drive it, we know how bad it is. And to set, you know, the priority of by how many people live there, what sort of traffic. I mean, you obviously have um, 
you know, a lot of people that live there, and like you said, you have connections to go to different places within the town, and it connects someone to Rochester, coming up Gilead. Um, uh, so that's the plan. So I can't give you a date, um, but I can certainly keep you informed of, you know, as we go through the schedule, you know, to let you know, you know, where, where you're at. Because right now I don't know, and I don't want to tell you, promise you we're going to do it next year when that's, you know, may not be true. And if we get another flood event, it's definitely not going to be true. So I wouldn't, I can't tell you anything that's not true. We can have more natural disasters. I mean, that's I what the predictions call for. So I that know. just keeps pushing us back. So. Well, what happens is, but because we do have capital road money and we do, we do qualify for certain grants in sections, like if you're hydrologically connected, if you're near the river. I did get a brick grant because uh, Jeff Gilman had brought to my attention that there was a structure at the base of Winterberry, kind of right in that area. So I did get a federal grant and they're out now, you may have seen them boring, doing some borings. They're out now doing engineering plans for that and then we'll do hopefully construction to replace that. So we do get money sections, but as far as someone to come in and say, we'll give you 200,000 towards paving. You know, that's not gonna happen. But we have money um, in the capital fund. We did, the select board did put some of the American Rescue Plan, the majority of the money um, they put into the road fund. I mean, well, they did some, and obviously sewer, to update sewer and water. So, um, yeah, so there's, I just can't give you a timeline, and I just, I'm not this, comfortable uh, telling you. you would uh, grind up the blacktop or whatever you do to it and convert it to dirt, is that, a no, I mean, we talk about it kind of, oh, we talk about it because it's one of those situations that we, if we did that, if we turned it to, to um, because it's just so bad, it's beyond saving, if we ground it into the material and added more material, and then we could leave it for a year or two and then pave, but we also understand very clearly that when some people bought their homes, they bought on pavement not on dirt, and I'm personally very sensitive to that, but we have talked about it just because it's so bad. If we can't do it all, but if we could take it to dirt and add material and make some corrections and then leave it for a couple of years to pave it, do it in stages, you know, I don't know, It's and I'm not sure that's the right answer either. Someone, I don't know, maybe you can answer that better for Sandy. Those right answers. So, so I think what the challenge we have right now with Gilead Road itself is, so it it didn't get its proper maintenance schedule. So, um, so when a road is paved, for instance, so let's say everything is good with the base and you pave pave it. So in Vermont, about every eleven years is is the life cycle of pavement. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the 11th year is the year that you start to pave. It might be year seven. Um, so there's a lot of really things that you should be doing, but most municipalities, including ours, can't afford to do that. Um, so it, it, as I think you had said, 1970. In 1973, three. years ago, it was already paved at that point, which was a prerequisite mm -hmm. for us in buying a house on a paved road. Right. So we, so we know it was done then. So we're, we're thinking, you know, 50 years, I mean, in 50 years, you probably should have had maintained it four times since then, right? And we're talking twice. So so the pavement structure right now is in a, in a situation that it's beyond pothole patching, unfortunately. So, and when I say that is, um, you know, the last couple of years, Teresa and I have been working to say, you know, here here are our uh, most problematic roads that we have. And Gilead has been on that list. And what can we do um, until we can do it properly? So, like, to be able to get the money to be able to do Gilead Road is, you know, can we just get by by pat pothole patching it? One, one thing that I had brought up um, to Therese was just, not knowing anybody on the road or if I wasn't in town is, and somebody just asked me, I'd say, what about taking it back to dirt? Just because that way you can maintenance the dirt much easier than you can maintenance potholes You're that, but I understand, but well, well, the thing right now is like, so what would happen, what would have happened 10 years ago in this town is we would right now, 
we would take the very poor condition that that pavement's in, and we'd probably go spend about $100,000 on that road to give it a nice, beautiful, thin coat of new asphalt. And everybody is going to be super happy for the first year and a half. But then what's going to happen is that pavement that's underneath it is already not structurally sound. That instantly, over one year, you're going to start seeing all the cracking, and it's all going to start breaking up again. And we've done that, and for anybody that's been on Camp Brook Road for years, that's all we've done up on Camp Brook Road. We pave over bad pavement over bad pavement. And we've spent hundreds, you know, millions of dollars up there on that, on that road. So the easy button is we can make it beautiful for $100,000, but we're only going to get maybe two years of life out of that. Um, so we're going to spend $100,000 worth of, worth of money for about two years that we're going to get out of this, um, which you know, that's then money that we don't have towards something else. So how can we get by? And, and I personally was one of the three individuals that went out pothole patch the 1.1 miles on Friday. So, um, and I usually help the, the guys out once a year because they don't have all the proper equipment and I, I loaned them equipment and tools to do it. Um, and I can tell you that being in the pavement industry that the road is beyond pothole patching. And when I say that is, you know, the pavement has to be able to bind structurally with something else around it to make the potholes not come back. So we did the best that we can. It'll probably last you the winter, but my guess is in the springtime it's going to be potholey again. Uh, just. Now, what's the difference between Gilead Brook and Christian Hill? I mean, population? No, grants. Christian Hill was a class two road, so we qualified for a paving grant. And because, um, Rock of Ages is up there. It had never really held up well, so there was a lot of um, wheel ruts, you know, in the pavement. But it was um, that's the big deal because it qualified for a paving grant. Mm -hmm. So that's why we did it because we were in the cycle. You could generally get a paving grant about every three years, and we were looking at Camp Brook, Christian Hill, and we felt like all right, Christian Hill was less than a mile. Let's just do it and get it done, and then the next paving grant we would focus on Camp Brook. But but that's the that's the, so the I mean so the be and, and since I've been here and I know Therese, uh, two of the big things that it's challenging to have discussions when you are being 100% transparent because that's we believe in transparency. Yeah. So when we give you information, sometimes you're gonna be like, oh, we don't like that information. But at <laughs> least we're being truthful with it. Is so oh. when we sit down, and we look at these plans. You know, we're, we're thinking how can we make Gilead the best that it can for the next probably five or six years? Because in the map, road map of things of what we think we might be able to have for money is available, we're looking like five or six years out for being able to correct the road the way it should be corrected. Um, and that's why we've thrown out some things like last year we threw out potentially taking it back down to dirt, which mm -hmm. wasn't very popular. Um, because we were in the same situation. It was right before our winter time and we were thinking we got a p pothole patch. All these potholes again, they're just going to come back again next year, which they did, you know. Um, and, and so we were just talking again, like, you know, we're talking five or six years looking at our financial capabilities of, of doing that without having to go to the voters and saying, you know, because if we, if, if we did this overnight, like we'd have to go to the voters and say we need you know, 20 cents on the tax rate for next year, which everybody's going to tell us, you know, that we need to vacate our seats <laughs> if we tried that. Um, so, so, my understanding is right now, the Arrow Staten Track live on uh, Trumpo Road yes. up in the backwoods of uh, the Gilead. And uh, uh, I've been fortunate in most instances to be a resident up there for about 40 years, and I've seen the entire cycle. From what Sandy was talking about, about the initial paving of the road, and yada, yada. And everything that you're uh, pushing out, I understand fully, in that the original sub base there is trash. It's not worth anything. And however, the difficulty is, is that that piece of road is an essential entryway into the Gilead. Anytime, the, uh, the ruts on the gravel won't get too bad or you can send a grader in. Uh, however, on the paved section, you're out of luck. 
you need special equipment to pack it down and all that. The question is right now, it is my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that we're looking at essentially a three to five year uh, effort here in order to be able to garner our resources to make uh, Gilead Brook Road be revamped up to what one would call a good specification. Is that correct? I just want to say that I have not sat down and done all the numbers now that we had the damage that <clears throat> I just calculated on Friday that it was about 1.3 million for this flood. So I don't want to say three to five years, it could be sooner. I, I would hate to say without me having done the math, but just to be fair. Okay. okay. Chris just said five to six years. Yeah. Right. I, whatever, whatever the situation may yeah. be is that is down the road. However, we as residents of the Gilead have to live with this on a daily basis. Now, the question that I toss back at you, let's say that we're talking that extended time interval to have that road corrected. What concerns us mostly is the fact that we would like to have the general maintenance on the road upgraded from once a year or twice a year with the patching to perhaps a more comprehensive way of looking at it that ensures the safety not only of the vehicle traffic but the pedestrians that are on the road. And I can back Sandy up with respect to the potholes. Somebody's walking down the road, you're trying to dodge a pothole and you know, but a bit, uh, there's somebody in the middle of the road. And it's like, whoa, uh, yeah. not a good situation. I feel like so, this time you... And, and just to finish up, and I would like to have some sort of progressive plan from you to take care of the difficulties over the span until we can get that road totally revamped. That is my principal suggestion and my principal concern. Thank you. I think that's a fair... I feel there, like it was done a little better this time than usual because there was a roller to go over the... Um, potholes after they were filled, whereas I think usually it's just left like with a bump and for us to drive over it to flatten it in. So I had higher hopes after this patch than usual. <laughs> yes, Jane. Uh, I think Gilead is kind of like the canary in the coal mine. Uh, in that you're bringing to our attention something that has been a growing problem for 50 years. Or more. All right? Or more. And it's called deferred maintenance. And you're up against something that none of us have planned for. And that is the increasing demands upon town budgets because of the increasing frequency of major storms and uh, et cetera. For even since Chris has come on board, <laughs> the, the capacity to maintain, quote, a reasonable tax load uh, seems to be outstripped so that situations like Gilead, which are not alone in the town of Bethel, uh, just continue to be put off and put off and put off. So my question for you is, as citizens of Bethel, uh, would you be open <laughs> to some sort of tax increase, uh, uh, whatever, going to the citizens and saying, we're 50 years behind on the maintenance of Gilead and a whole bunch of other things. We have to get caught up so that we can then keep up. So, my, so the question, my, and this is a question that comes up before the select board every single time we meet. 
how much will the citizens support financially when it comes to taxes, bond issues, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so part of me wants to say, uh, I understand and I see what's going on. I also hear, I'm, the, I'm almost the newest kid on, up here. Uh, but as we uncover systemic structural issues like this, uh, when, how can we approach, how would you suggest we approach the citizens to say, we got some problems, and because you're going to keep getting robbed by storms, I don't think they're going to let up in frequent, I, met, I think they're going to continue to increase in frequency and severity. We'll never get caught up if we're just re relying on uh, see, all of our capital improvement money now went in to match grants to fix floods. This is my question of you, I don't, I don't expect an answer. Well, we take care of our water, we take care of our sewage. We I, look to the town to help us take care of our roads. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you yeah. at all. I mean, I'm just, but I, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to get my head around the systemic, structural, ongoing, 50-year-old issue that has been plaguing you for years uh, without getting the attention you deserve. I don't have an answer. It, it's also hard to say, I think, throwing a, you know, because there's other things to just that. I mean, I know we're going to be, sorry, I see your hand up. We're going to do, uh, you know, we need to increase to the capital equipment appropriation. So it's hard to say. I mean, I, how I think much you could support. There's a gentleman in yeah. the back. Yeah. This is, my own ignorance, but can the road not be reclassified as a class two road so that it qualifies for grants? That's so funny that you said it. Lindley was, I was just responding to a message in the chat, and that's what Lindley asked, is if it could be upgraded to a class two. And I told her that I didn't know, um, well, yes, I mean, it could be, but I wonder if it could, it would probably have to happen after the $500,000 plus repair. Because if that's 500,000 now, I don't know what that's gonna be in a few years, but that's a great question. And that was actually one that Lindley, the select board member just messaged me. And so it's something to look into is, why not? We can reclassify roads. So we would have to bring it to a certain standard and, um, but since Jeff did the culverts and we, you know, would do some ditching and it's a possibility definitely to look into because then you're right, it makes a lot of sense and I hadn't even <coughs> considered it. So it makes sense to try. And I think the, the real issue that we had with Gilead was, I mean, we're, you know, like Gene was saying, we're going to have more storms that we're going to have to deal with. But, you know, the, there was never really a formal plan in place in the town. So... So now we're trying to play catch up, and catch up means we have to prioritize things that maybe we wouldn't normally. But at the same time, we keep, at, you know, it's like whack-a-mole. We're like, we feel so good, like, hey, we got this done, and then two other things pop up, right? And we're kind of in that right now. Um, so we're even starting to plan for storms that haven't happened, right? Um, but the, the challenge that we had uh, a few years ago is we had, we had Christian Hill, Sand Hill, Gilead, and the bottom half of Camp Brook Road, which are the four main concerns roads that we had to deal with. Um, and then, then we gotta kind of just categorize those into what can we get for matching money so we get our best bang for a buck and safety wise. So we start looking at, at that time, Christian Hill had the, the most major issues because they're literally the, the wheel ruts were like this deep to the point where we're having trouble doing winter maintenance and things like that. Um, plus, we were able to get a grant. Sand Hill, we were able to kind of do the same thing. Like we did um, some of the money, it was in there to do the uh, water line piece, and we were able to get grant through Senator Sanders. So those two kind of took care of themselves. 
So the next two that we've been working on has been Gilead and the lower, when I say the lower portion of um, Camp Brook, it's like the lower mile and a half portion of Camp Brook, which both roads are about in the similar situations where they need to be taken back down to dirt and redone. Um, and both of those roads right now, we have no matching funds to do anything with. So it's a 100% hit that we're trying to figure out. So, and these are the challenges is one time years ago, Camp Brook Road was a federally funded highway. At some point, the federal government came to the town and said, would you like to have this road? And we said yes, <laughs> which was not a very good thing because now we have to take on 100% of of all the maintenance on that road. Now, when natural disasters happen, they often will chip in and pay, like right now we have some culverts that have failed up there. Most of the time they will come in and they will pay 100% to fix things like that, but they don't give us money necessarily to go up there and say we want to pave or fix this portion of the road. And Gilead's kind of the same thing where, where, um, you have to be careful when you start talking about like pavement's nice and I would like to pave everything because I work for paving industry, right? So that we want to pave everything. So if you hear the paving guy say maybe paving is not the right thing, then then it's probably pretty bad. So you have to be careful when you want to move something from dirt to pavement because how are you going to fund that going forward? A lot of your paved roads are funded through class grants. So that's the only way towns can function with that is we we get, a lot of times we'll get, you know, 70, 30 money or 80, 20 money where we only have to put in 20 or 30% mm. to pave that road. Gilead, the way that it was, for whatever reason, when they paved, decided to pave that road, is it's not a road that even offers class grants for us to pave it. So it's kind of, what was the decision at that time and was it the right decision? I mean, it's nice to have a paved road, but. But then if we knew that there wasn't going to be grant opportunities, then we should have had a longer standing plan to fund it ourselves, right? Uh, every year we chip, you know, put so much money aside so that we can maintain that road. And we don't have that. So now we're kind of, we're, we're, we're way behind the eight ball here and we're trying to do the best that we can. But I like the idea of looking to see if once we do the upgrade, if we could make it an upgrade to make it a class two, that makes a lot of sense. And the other thing too is just to give you the full financial picture since I've told you about the 1.3 million in damage and we're gonna eat 12 and a half percent of that. The other thing is on Camp Brook, we had two culverts fail, major culverts fail. Um, one is being taken care of by Federal Highway, the other one is not. And the first estimate I was given was between six and eight hundred thousand dollars. And I cried a little inside because I know I didn't have that kind of money, but we're working with the state and we have secured some material. It looks like they're going to allow us to transfer a $200,000 <clears> structures grant that I had for Peavine, where the temporary bridge is, to move it there. I got a culvert from the state, from the Rochester Grad. So you're trying to piece it all together, but at the same time going, mm, you know, it doesn't help your cause. But I definitely like the, I love the idea of seeing if we could make it class two when we do an upgrade. And I like, you know, Stan's idea of let's, even if, okay, so we can't do it for a while, how much money do we need to set aside each year for pay patching? You know, is it five grand, 10 grand, and to get you to where you need to be so it's safe? But I, sorry, I saw your hand up and I saw Spencer's hand up. Yeah, but my questions are, are a little, they're not random, but they're just like in different categories. How typical is it to even pay the third class road? I think it's unusual. I'm not sure. That, that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah, I don't know. And then know. how difficult is it to upgrade a third class road to a second class road? I don't know. And so I'm going to look because there's a standard. I know for some roads like an A76 standard, I would assume something like that, that the state puts out. But I, I'm going to research it and look because if we've done culverts, if we do ditching and we're going to redo the road, I don't know what we would, what's a little extra we would need to do to make it a class too, so that's a great question. So I'm going to find out because now I want to know. And then the other question is, and you've alluded to the, uh, you know, the the foggy past of no one really knows. It was great to get it paved 50 years or more ago, yeah. but why and why just that much? It may have had to do with how much, how far the money would go. Could be. But the question then arises now is, as this conversation has been rolling on tonight, is 
Would you just be planning to pave the part that is paved and leave the rest as is? Yes. What, what, and why, and, but yet without a rationale of why did it only go so far? I mean, I don't even know what the development is <clears throat> uh, on that road other than to know there's a long flat and then it goes up into right. the, the splits off. But um, there's, there's an agricultural, you know, the further back yeah, you go, oh, it's yeah. agricultural and that may be just fine for everybody that lives there. But, yeah. but maybe there's an extension of road that <clears throat> should or could be paved. The reason I say no right now is just monetarily, because if we're looking at 500000 now, I don't know what that's going to look like when we finally get to it. So <clears throat> that makes me a little nervous. But once we have more information about, you know, class three versus two, what's the, you know, I have to look at the codes and standards that we sign for the state to see what that would be. I don't know. It's a good question to ask. My understanding was... Um, at the time, apparently it was a popular idea in Vermont is that people were, I don't know if it was a state, if it was a pilot program or if the state came in and paid. But at the time, my understanding, what I've heard, um, and you know, could be just rumor and innuendo, was that the state thought it was the next you know, best thing and that they could come in and put it down and it would last forever. But you know, that's just what I heard from someone. I, I don't know, you know for sure what the what the thought process was, or honestly, even if there was one, because it doesn't make sense that they would have just come in and paved over. Yeah. I don't know. And one last point. Of course. I just had uh, W.B. Rogers um, prep my driveway in yeah. anticipation of paving. So, you know, nice. I, my head is filled with paving and, and proper <laughs> underlay. Yeah. It was never done before when it was paved, so right. you know, very much like um, Gilead, Brook Road, yeah. except it's just my drive, and they had to go down 18 inches, which yeah. was kind of astounding in a, just somebody's yard to see that much, really, that much. Yeah. So I don't know if, that, if it's even deeper on a road, but what it, what it tells me, I'm really glad I'm doing it because I don't have to worry about it, but I would, I would, uh, I would suggest that if the rest of the unpaved road got redone with hard pack, instead of calling it a dirt road, it's really not, it's a hard pack road is what you really want to be talking about. Once you do that, it's not, it's not permanent, it's not as permanent or impervious to movement, but if you put it down with a geotextile at the bottom and you, and you drain it properly and, and um, contour it, Thank it's you. a whole lot better than the, the unpaved road right now. Absolutely. I mean, it's what was done, what gets done every year on that unpaved road is just its version of patching that as well. So that the rest of it could stay unpaved, but yet be far superior to what exists now. Absolutely. And that's what we ended up doing on, you know, Christian Hill was going down and looking to see if we needed um, any under drain and, and all that. So definitely. Sorry, there's something wrong with the alarm, so it beeps when the door goes off and it gets the burglary alarm. Um, so you do that. You start underneath and, and, and definitely um, take all that into consideration. Do you need perforated pipe? Do you need, you know, under drain? What is it you need to, to keep the key is, once you build it, is to keep the water off the road so it just doesn't sit on it and, and deteriorate. So, and, and those Spencer, are all things you had your hand up a while ago. We don't know. And, and well, no, no, wait, 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 wait <laughs> yeah. let me just finish. Yeah. We haven't addressed what our day-to-day -day is going to be like. Now, you guys just came. Was that like a big deal that you guys came? Was that like something you had planned months and months and months just to come to Gilead to do what you did the other on Friday? No, we always knew we were going to patch Gilead before snow flew. It just. Yeah, but you're talking, you know, once before snow, and then the next time, maybe what, next day? Right. And, so and the point I'm making is that day to day schedule that you have to us is unacceptable. Yep. So we're going to have to figure something out because all we're talking about here is this big long term project, which I get obviously takes planning. You're talking about three years to do. Christian Hill, of course. I had a client there this spring before you guys did that. I had to go visit them. I wish that Gilead was even 
never said of how good Kristen Hill was before you ended up redoing it. And three years ago, you said, hey, we got to redo it. It's like, our road is not even close to how that was before you paved it. Mm -hmm. So there's one thing there. So I'm just trying to figure out how. Um, the other thing I know is that I got there in 94, and there was a major repayment. You know, as you said, just an overlay or whatever mm -hmm. it's called. It lasted a lot longer than a year and a half. Really, it did. It okay. lasted maybe eight or ten years. And you're talking a hundred thousand dollars? That could take us for another six, seven, eight years. I don't know. I know you know more about paving than me, but I remember that they, you know, they we did that road. And it was great. For definitely longer than a year and a half. Okay. And the other thing is, I'm just curious about why that when you came Friday, did a great job just for passing it up. Even some flat surfaces that were, you know, like like ten foot sections. It was like outrageous. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering why we can't get some attention like that, like a little more. I think that what Slavko suggested is is a good idea, which is to kind of look at the plan to set aside. We're actually it's perfect timing for the conversation because we'll be going into budget season, which is to look at it and say, okay, if we can't do the big fix for X amount of years, then what? Then we're going to need to be out there doing a better job, pothole patching, and how much money is that going to cost? And set that aside to put it in a schedule. So I completely agree with you that, and, and I think that was a great idea. So. I just didn't know you had it in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's, I think it's because, because you had the right equipment and yeah. somebody who really knew the great. business. It was like, wow. Yeah. But well, I, I think the challenge is, and again, it's the challenge we have is we, we try to do as much as we can with as little people, right, to keep tax rates down. So, you know, we have a three person public works department. And I would say on a normal year, that is probably one less person than you probably need. You know, you probably need one more person to get all the things you need done in town. Um, but then you, no excuses again, but then you cripple it with what's happened since July. And almost every day since July, one, two, or all three of our public works individuals are aiding a contractor in town trying to do something to get one of these roads done. So a lot of our time has been going to that. Um, I will say nothing against them, but they're they're definitely, you know, most towns, you know, if they're going to go pothole patching, right, pothole patching is just, they just grab some patch, throw it in a hole, it probably heaves over like this, and it's a big bump or something, right? It's just something quick fix, right? Um, and, and it kind of is a big deal because it doesn't sound like a lot, so I've been talking, every year I go help the guys at the end of the year pothole patch. So we did Sand Hill and and Camp Brook Road and, uh, and, and Christian Hill last year, I helped them. Um, they don't have all the right tools, and um, so it kind of is a little bit of a big deal, like we did, like, so, yeah, so I was able to get, Equipment donated so that we could do it and then you know I did most of the looting and rolling but so it is probably a little nicer than normal not to say that the guys didn't do as much as they did but but again it, it's just pothole patch you know like it's when you get to the pothole patch on your road it's usually kind of like okay we got like a year or two and then we're like redoing this thing because once it gets to that point you're the road is it's pretty worn and and we're, I wish we had a better, a better plan. Like we're going there tomorrow, you know, or or next spring. But we we really got to take a look at the budget and figure out where where we can do it and what makes most sense. And again, we're it's tricky because I really want to go there, but we also want to just not get back to the way in town where we're just putting out fires and putting out fires. And if we go put a hundred grand down in Gilead. And then say it does hold for seven years, and we're like, okay, well, well go somewhere else, right? And then, and then we're going to get back in seven years, we're going to be like, oh, my God, these poles are back. And we're going to be like, yeah, we saved no money, you know? Um, so we're trying to do it the right, you know, the right way. Um,
It's uh, with the current grand list, within reason, uh, twenty-one thousand dollars on is one penny on the tax rate. One cent on the tax rate is about, or one percent to one cent is about, is about uh, one cent is about twenty-one thousand dollars. I'm sorry, what? Well, the, the appraisal will not make any, oh. dif make any difference in the town's revenue because what, how that's calculated is you take the town's budget <laughs> and you divide it by the number of dollars that there are in appraised values, whether that's today's appraisal or 10 years ago's appraisal. Yeah, the, the appraisal will just, what it does is just kind of resets the baseline for the town. Um, you know, some people that either maybe did a bunch of work in the last 15 years to their house probably will see their value go up a little higher than 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 their counterpart. And then some people that maybe haven't done anything with their house in a while might see theirs go down a little bit. But it just reestablishes that baseline. It doesn't mean that we have an extra influx of cash. And it doesn't mean necessarily that your taxes go up either. It just It's just a new baseline that we... Uh, well, now we're going to have to do every six or seven years, I guess, yes, with absolutely. the new government. So. We're closing in on an hour, and I know you mm -hmm. have other business. I, I think it's unless anybody else has, yeah. Uh, but I just want to say before Julie speaks that I think this has um, been a good discussion, a good exchange. Uh, you can see that there's a, a depth of feeling almost as deep as the potholes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know that you know how we feel, and, uh, you know, tax. Uh, issue is not that's not out of the question. We don't know what it might be, but we've got to explore everything, I think. And I hope you'll keep us informed. Let us know if we can help. We yes, no, definitely. And I, and I really appreciate all the, I think, the what, um, so I'll have to go ahead and say it was great and some think about to look at, you know, what it's going to take to become, Just you know, class two because I don't know for sure and to find out. And, um, but certainly there's no reason that we can't budget for, you know, more pothole patching. It's not the long-term fix, but it makes it safer for pedestrians, better for driving, and, and but certainly once we work on the schedule, my goal for the winter is I want to schedule so that if you lived on Abbott Road or McIntosh or whatever, you could, there would be a plan. Good. So obviously that would change if there was a disaster, but at least I could say to you, okay, Sandy, I'm going to get to your road here, and you know, and Joe, I'm going to get to your road mm -hmm. here. You know, maybe it's years apart, but at least we'd have an idea so that yes. when the road crew starts, when they say April, they're ordering culverts. They're ordering what they need so that once the snow's gone, they're going to roll out and start doing. They'll know where they're headed. Maybe divide the town, which is what we do every time it floods. I take a marker, drive the line, and put it into four quadrants, and then we start going that way and try to work at it. But do appreciate your patience, and I'm so sorry I had such a close call, and I'm sure Spencer was scared to death, so I'm it sorry that. Me. I know, and I'm so sorry that happened. <laughs> Best friends. I'm well, sorry, Julie. Well, I know there was some, when I was out there pothole patching on Friday, there was a white SUV from Massachusetts that went by me and almost hit me when I was out there fixing the potholes, and they were flying. I mean, they didn't even slow down. And anybody that drove by us on Friday knew that we were probably in the middle of the road most of the time. So there was no room to like, kind of like get around you. And this person didn't even break. They just, <laughs> I mean, they hit the shoulder and went around. <laughs> I was almost giving up for the day at that yeah. point. I slowed down, I pulled my window down, <laughs> and everybody was working on a road rain behind the truck. Yeah. Because they didn't want me to, I, I just want to say they were doing a great job, yeah. you know, filling those bottles. And well, I was very happy about the whole situation because it was really bad. Mm -hmm. It was, and we'd been out, and when Sandy had called originally, I sent the road foreman out, and he went out, he sent me some pictures, we talked about it, so, you, you know, maybe, so behind the scenes, we, it was a conversation. I've also been up there because of Gilead and other things, so I travel that road myself, and, um, you know, looking at Pinello Bridge, and so you'll have some big construction this year, hopefully. Fingers crossed, we're finally going to get that bridge built. Why? Huh? <laughs> yeah, well, because if you remember, a bunch of, you know, people were in support of that. No, people were in support of that. I know. Is that really a priority? Well, it was for the homeowner. We tried multiple options, including a buyout, and but the owners were not interested. That was after the 2019 flood, and 
So some things happened, and um, I was not the town manager at the time. And um, but we did try a buyout. We tried a process, and they had a lot of support from people on the road to get it done. I'm sure nobody had any idea that it was going to be 1.1 million. But um, I figured Armageddon, and that bridge is going to be solid. So <laughs> we may not connect on either side, but the bridge will be there. And, so and we'll be starting our well, we'll be starting our budgeting pieces here soon. Huh. Um, usually the end of October, 1st of November is when we start talking budget. So we will, you know, at one point we will be talking about the public works budget, which usually carries paving and other mm -hmm. things. So, you know, definitely keep keep uh, up to speed with what's going on there. The, the other thing, just so that you know, I mean, as, you know, as a citizen voter of the town, you do have the right to petition things to be put on to, um, the town meeting warning. So um, it can be, you know, anything, but in your case, it could be, you know, paving Gilead, you know, or something with a certain dollar amount. So those, you know, you have the right to do that. And I believe it's just 1% of the, I'd have to come it's like 20 it. signatures that you'd get or something I'd like, like that. But. Julie, she had her hand up quite some time ago. I just want to say I'm a cyclist on the road and those potholes will take someone out. Not even the deep ones. And I worry about Sandy walking, um, Bennett and Tom walk the road. I just think it's sure. a real disservice. And I'm scared for my neighbors for driving on the road. It's, it's a scary place to be in. Well, not even, but it's been very scary. <laughs> yeah, for but months. it is, yes. And I it's understand. been scary for months, and we've spoken up about it, and we still didn't have potholes filling for months. No. Nope. So that's a problem. Right. Well, and, and true, and I had seen Sandy a little while ago, and I'm on Gilead. I was there for another reason, meeting with another family about a different issue um, with them and Jeff Gilman. And, um, you know, it, what happened was obviously the flood. So when the flooding happened in July, the 7th, and then again on the 10th, and then the continual rain, um, and, and I said to her, and, and I didn't mean any disrespect by it, but it, it wasn't a priority at that point when we were missing chunks of other roads and had other issues. So... We knew it, and we weren't ignoring it. It was just, it w was, you're putting the fingers in the dam, basically. But I appreciate what you're saying, and, and, and you're right. I've driven it, and, it, and I've walked sections of it, and we need to do better. Thank you. Oops, there's a couple people with hands up. Brian was one, and then someone behind that. Just a quick thing. Uh, so if you traveled up Gila, you noticed the potholes in the dirt road, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did. <laughs> We haven't seen a grader since. Well, we've seen a grader, but not the town's grader since. Right, yeah. Day. No, I had um, Gary Slack did a great job up there. Um, W.B. Rogers did some work for us. They did Christian Hill and Trout Brook, and, and obviously, um, you know, they know what they're doing, so. Yeah. You guys did do a great job, you know, paving the road this past weekend, or week, and we're just Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And it's too bad that you can't do it that way every time because Absolutely. I feel like it's such a waste of time and money, tax money, wherever it comes from, mm -hmm. um, when you do those, those short little fixes because literally it's always on a rainy day and they don't last 24 right. hours. Well, Come I think that's a good, that's an excellent point about making sure that we have the equipment we need even if we rent yeah. it for the time. And as far as taxes, like are we willing to pay more in our taxes to help get the, pay, the road paid properly. Um, you know, things come up, as you say, and who's to say if they do raise our taxes specifically for our road, are we going to see that money put in the proper place? You know? Right, exactly. If the currently money like that isn't a one line, it goes to like the capital road or capital, you know, expense. So you're right, unless it was a line item specifically earmarked for, for you that said, you know, it's going to Gilead, but but it's it's a lot. It's great information, and I'm so glad that you all came. And so it's going to help because I do keep track of the budget, obviously, all year, and I plan for next year's budget all the time. People come in and what's going on, and so we'll have a better idea of what it looks like. And that's why I really believe we need a capital road plan so we have an idea about resources, and they are limited, and and um, but to make the best. Of it. And and we hope, and when we do set aside the capital road. Um, money it, there is a well there has been a plan now that will show you know what year we think certain things use the big stuff I mean if it's a small road that usually it's not on there but the big stuff like we'll see you know Sand Hill or Christian Hill or so the, the hope would be when we're doing this that we'd see
kind of a placeholder where we think it's going to land yeah. um, when we're doing that in our but I like the idea plan of this year, seeing so. about class two because boy that would alleviate a lot of stuff and it's a 80 20 split which is a lot better than what we're looking at right now so but uh, well thank you I'm so glad you all came thank you very much thank you. yes yes you too yeah do you have um do we have can you give me your email oh okay I'll then I'll talk to Sandy okay and she'll let you know all right that sounds good but thank you for coming I appreciate it take care nice to see you Well, it means we didn't have a whole lot tonight. I didn't think no. that we needed to no, no. No, it's good. keep the time in. So we'll just switch over to um, if there's any public comment. So anything that's not on the agenda that anybody may want to add on. What's the update on the uh, What's the update on the Upper Gilead, past Andrews? They did some trimming and dumped a couple loads of stuff, but the water's still running down. The yeah, they need to come back. Something happened that day. Oh, I know what happened. They were up there, and they had their equipment up there, and I, I actually have a meeting with them tomorrow morning to figure out what their, the rest of their schedule is. Um, Richard, the water operator, was on vacation, and we had a water leak, so they had to pull off, which was not the plan, to come and dig on um, St. Hyacinth. Because we got a call that they were, and, and of course we couldn't find the shutoff, and some lady's basement is flooding, so they pulled off and um, to come out and do that, and then we ended up getting a little further in our FEMA process, and they had to go back out to Findlay. But um, I'm glad you mentioned that because we we no, they need to come back and finish, and you're totally right, Brian. So I'm gonna because I meet with them in the morning to figure out the schedule for the rest of the month, but. Yeah, when I found out, I called and they were up there. I was like, so. Or water, something, yeah. So they definitely need to get back. And we're setting up, we also ended up getting some more work dumped in our plate from FEMA than we anticipated. So, because we're running to finish, but we're fighting people for contractors because, you know, Jeff Gilman is, you know, got his stuff and he's, you know, going gangbusters. He's still got the West Quadrant, plus he's going to rebuild Cleveland Brook. We've got Derek Aldrigetti won a couple bids, so you're trying to keep everybody going. But thank you for reminding me. But that's why they pulled off that day. Otherwise, we'd be done. So sorry about that. Thank you. Yeah, take care, Brian. I don't know if there's anyone online. <clears throat> Gene? Yeah, I have a public comment. I'm recognizing it. Today is Indigenous Peoples Day, and I would like to uh, acknowledge that we are currently living and governing a community that lives on what, what one time was Abenaki land, and uh, they never gave permission for anybody to come and take it over. Uh, and I would request uh, that we ask the Inclusion and Equ Equity and Inclusion Committee to, uh, in consultation with the Missisquoi Band of the Abenaki, uh, to propose a, a recognition statement that we might use at certain town events. So Christie's online. Um, representing the Equity and Inclusion Committee tonight. Did you hear that, Christy? Hi, Christy. Whoops, we just lost you. Hang on. Is it us, Jamie? Yeah, it's on our end. Is it us, Jamie, or her? No, it's on our end. Not sure. Just We're Lin looking. Lindley can't hear us either. Okay, Christy can hear us. So hang on, Christy. We're looking. We might have technical just as you started speaking. <laughs> Poor Christy. Oh, thank you. Hey. <laughs> 
Hey, God. <laughs> Jamie's trying to fix it, Christy. Mm. But I saw your response. Christy wrote in the chat that she would take it back to the, let me see, equity inclusion. Let me quote her directly because I can read the chat. Christy said, I can hear you. Lindley says, we can hear you. Okay, Christy said, I did, I did hear the request of Jean and will share with the EIC. So yeah, it's, Jean, just, it's just our speaker. It's then. us. Thank you. <clears throat> so Jean says, thumbs up. <laughs> Sorry, Christy has acknowledged. <laughs> We're going to do hand signals the rest of the night. Or I guess I'll read the chat. So Doug Marshall's on and Lily. Did anybody have anything else for public comment besides Jean and Brian? So we'll just move forward. If somebody does have something, you can always type it in the comment piece of the chat. Um, next, uh, well, we didn't have a whole lot on the meeting tonight. So the um, just update in the July flood event stuff. So I did, um, we were able to get for the culvert that the second culvert that failed on Camp Brook that Federal Highway is not going to pay for. Um, we did, I spoke to Ryan Slack and he came in and said, hey, uh, over at the State Garage in Rochester, we got a 10 foot culvert with collars. And I'm like, hmm. So I called Chris Bump and then he spoke to Chris Bump and then we made a requisition. And so we're going to get that material. Um, from the state. They said it's a quote unquote temporary and when we dig it up we need to give it back and have it removed gently but well, I don't know when that'll be. But we didn't say which decade, <laughs> yeah, which decade we have to return it. <laughs> Could be a while and um, but I have to work with Chris Bump tomorrow to to try to make the, rec the request to transfer my grant from Gilead, uh, Gilead on the brain now, Peavine to the um, to Camp Brook. So to see what that is, we're still looking for a contractor. Chris Bump and I talked about it, and we are going out to bid on the upper section. So I want to talk to him tomorrow because part of me was thinking, maybe we should see if the upper contractor wants to do it. If we have the material, they could come in, they could do it. Because timing is of the essence here, because if they're going to tear the upper one out, I can't have mine you know, torn out. So we still have a couple other repairs to do there. Um, I haven't seen the hydraulic study yet that the Federal Highway wanted. I did not request one, but they did to do a section to culvert. I was just going to go in and replace it and call it a day, but they have called out a four-footer. So I did reach out to Contech today to see if they have one because I ordered one for Perm. I don't know if it arrived last week. It should have. If not, it'll be early this week. And it took, you know, it's going to take three weeks to get it. I'm like... A four foot culvert, yes. The problem crazy. is that the inventories, well, <clears throat> overall inventories have been low ever since COVID just because of workforce limitations. And and then with the flood, like all the culverts have been like two foot and under, you can still get, but above two foot, they're hard to get. Yeah. So we're, so we, I need to get, so I still need to have that culvert replaced. Hopefully I get the hydraulic study tomorrow have a bank armament, some work around Jim Ford, and that will be covered by Federal Highway, but I need to get it, you know, <laughs> that I'd, I'm trying to sort out with Chris Bump as well. So the rest of the flood work um, is coming along. Some of it, obviously, we haven't started yet. We haven't started Abbott, Old Route 12, Fish Hill, um, but Woodland is just about wrapped up. I think uh, Chris just needs a final grading and some little material there. Uh, Jeff's going gangbusters on the west section, and then he's, what is he hoping to be at Cleveland Brook in two weeks? Yeah, Wood, Woodland's done. Louisville, Whittier, Ringe, Brink, those are mostly done. Thayer, they're working on, or the upper part of Brink they were working on today. Thayer um, this week, and then um, next week will be Dunham, Sugar Hill, and Campbell. Kind of, yep. and then the west pieces will be done. 
I'm still trying to work on the other contractor to come in to start doing some of the um, Peavine, Sand Hill, um, Old Route 12 stuff, Abbott, um, waiting on their response. Culvert for the... Yes. Yep, that will get a new culvert, yep. And we have it. He ordered it already. Yeah, so we're just waiting on that. So, I mean, I, I think the... I think the work's getting done at an okay pace. It's it's kind of nice in a way because if they all decided to work at the same time, it would make it impossible for me to be in four different places at the same time plus do my own job. But um, So I think it's a comfortable pace for me to keep keep ahead. But, you know, we're starting to get right up against, you know, Mother Nature. At some point, it's yeah. going to say, you're done. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are some areas that we're a little nervous about right now just because of lead time for materials and and not having a contractor li line up. Yeah. And, 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 and that's where it's tricky to, like, you know, where, you know, we should have our guys out there doing grading and doing all these last final fall prep stuff. Instead, they are, okay, they're going to go to Perm and help with that installation. And this day, they're over here helping this person. And so that's kind of yeah, where we're... Yeah, they're on North Road, yeah. That's kind of where we're just, we're stuck right now. It's, um, and, you know, we're only whatever, five weeks away from Mother Nature saying we're done for the year, so. And we haven't even made a decision about my road. What, what, well, we did make a decision about your road, which is <clears throat> we have the road crews out there now. They're there. You guys passed on it um, doing the bigger fix. So what we're doing is they are reinstalling a berm. They were not concerned about the slide section. Um, so they're reinstalling a berm and rebuilding a couple sections. We're going to ask to work. We're going to try to. We're going to work with Dylan McCullough to do, um, to do uh, the culvert because he has a big enough piece to do perm. And then once they're done there, we need to go to Findlay because he has a big enough machine. There's a big enough chunk out of the road where we need his arm, his machine to lead in to fill it back out. So that's on the list. They had been doing some work out there. I don't know the status yet. I'll know in the morning, but. That's where we're headed with that. And, and Perm, yeah, hopefully the, fingers crossed, the guys didn't tell me, but the culvert came in last week is what I'm hoping for. Because I'd like to see them do that next week. Yep. I don't know. I mean, no, well, I know that the, um, AJ, sorry, brain cramp, has been in touch with John Deere. They've ordered the, they were ordering the block, so they were going to kind of let us know when they had the parts. So, and they actually were only going to have it in the shop for a much shorter time. So we were, you know, we were thinking it was going to be out of commission for a month, and that's not the case. So maybe a week, but hopefully. And the, and the challenge is right now. Hopefully it can go in November. That machine should be running steady right now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yep. Yeah, and the absolutely. challenges that we're having just in the industry right now, it's like even at my work, you know, we're used to, if something breaks down, it's it's overnighted, we have it the next day, you know? I mean, the thing could come from California, we have it the next day. And right now, things break down because inventories are so low, we can't get it. Yeah, I'm scared or that Or it might be a week, or, you know, and, workers were striking. and, you know, my company usually is really fast about getting stuff, so then you got to think, you know, when you get down to the town level or some of the private levels, it takes longer and longer to get the We don't parts. have the kind of money they have. So. Um, <laughs> but it, it's just, it, it's really ugly. I mean, reach. I mean, you even look at, like, just mm -hmm. simple, like, you know, automobile parts and things like that to get them. Like, you know, yeah. no idea when you're going to get it, you know? So it's... There you go. Some of them yeah. are six months to a year. So they're challenging. Yeah. Especially anything big, you know, John Deere, Cat, you know, any of those yeah. big pieces right now are tough to get. Um, but yeah, so we have a meeting, myself, AJ, and Morgan. I did a schedule today, mm -hmm. picked out all, you know, the days we have left this month. What do we have left for work? This is how I see it figuring out, taking Morgan out of the mix for the this week. There are three days left because I'm pretty sure he'll be working with Dan. And, um, but... I had them, I'm, they're bringing their list. So what do they have that I don't know about so that we can go through the rest of the month and then every day they have a schedule. Are they back on five days? No, no. Would that be advisable? Yes, and we've talked about it. I actually don't know, I can't remember. We, we go through this every year. I keep telling them every time I do the ride, we're going to revise the personnel policy that they've got to make a, make a plan. And um, I can't remember what the... They came back sooner than the prior road crew, so I can't remember if we decided on after Columbus Day or 
or what, honestly, I just, I don't and, remember. And I think I some of that him. can just be done as needed. I mean, if yeah. you need to switch we're earlier, then. Money from, from the Fed, so it's not like it's going to hurt our budget. Because mm -hmm. they're working with other contractors on FEMA work. Oh, exactly. No, and, and that's all, I have all the worksheets done for labor. So there's money currently, and you could see it in your budget where I wrote, you know, there's FEMA money in Well, here. the challenge thing, too, is it's not just, it's, it's them wanting to work that fifth day, and it sounds weird, but, you know, some of them have Friday day jobs lined up. You know, they like do, yeah. They go work with somebody else for the day, which, yep. you know, I know they worked last Friday because they were out pothole patching with me. But Right, but you're um, right. At least, so I know one of them has a regular gig that he does on Fridays, and the other one, and the other one I think is maybe not every Friday, but it's fairly regular. So... Um, but again, like I said, I have to talk to them because we have this conversation every year about when they're coming back. And, um, but I think Dave, and we may have decided on Columbus, and I just, frankly, I think Dave I makes a good no point. Though. I would just, I mean, I think right now with the amount of work that we have, yeah. I would say, listen, we got to get you back working five mm -hmm. days. And, yeah, I'll talk to them tomorrow because I don't know um, what their plan is for their Because, you know, we do have, there. you know, when the grader is up and running, we go. Like we talked about today, today we got yeah, a bunch exactly. of grading that needs to get done. We have the absolutely the last minute stuff before winter that we are always yeah. chasing some pothole patching and trimming this. And As I, I spoke so. about, you know, our hill is there's a lot of there's a lot of flood work that is not not done. Yep, yep, exactly. So I mean, it's not days and days in single places, but by you add it up. Absolutely, yeah. We talked about that, and that was my thing, and I wrote it in the note as, as we discussed, which was pick a quadrant and stay there till it's done, and then move and go that way. That way, this is all tied up, and then you move on. And and I have a feeling, I mean, they have a normal rotation of how they grade, and I'm, my guess is they already do that, but we'll find out tomorrow when I meet with them. So, And we'll talk to them about when they're coming back, because I'm sure they have said, and frankly, I don't, I have no idea. I'd be lying if I told you I did. But that's the update on the flood stuff. And then changing, you don't want to work Christmas morning? Actually, you know, I didn't even catch it. Uh, Pam did. She was, before the sign was taken out in, in the accident, she was going to put the letters up to it, and she said yeah, she Christmas always, got yeah, all she, over the place, yeah. she does three months in advance, you know, so she was like, Trace, I'm sure you don't want to meet on Christmas, so the select board needs to adjust. And then it also dawned on me as, I'd forgotten. I have a note on my calendar, but in one meeting in November, we're not going to be able to do here because of window dressers. So we'll probably just meet at the town office yeah, or something that, that day. And um, what you always did before. But yeah, so Christmas, uh, my suggestion was move it to the 18th. So you did two, you know, back to back, just, but I don't know what y'all have for plans. Lindley's given the thumbs up. Now, when we have that meeting on November 2nd on a Thursday, is that going to count as a select board meeting, or is that just a special meeting? It's it's a special, special select board meeting. meeting. Okay. <laughs> it covers board. both bases. It's both. Okay. But it does not take the place That's of okay. any yeah. other meeting. That's what I just wanted yeah. to double check. Yeah. I didn't think it did, but I just, I you know, know, for inquiring Wishful minds thinking. out there. <laughs> inquiring minds want to know. And so you do not need minutes at the visit. On the seventh. No, no. If we do, but I'll here. take them. I'll take them. I really don't want to hide those. Yeah, there. no, no. You're fine. I'll <laughs> take it. It's fine. I, I have to look at the. And the I have to double check. I actually think it may have to be. I don't know which part has to be recorded. I have to double check. But David Rue, our the town attorney, will be with us. He will be there, so we will know. So everything will be done according to Hoyle, yeah, as they say. Decision on the 18th. No, no one said anything yet, except for Lindley. She said it was okay with her. Is it all right with you guys, or are you traveling? We don't travel anywhere. Well, then you're easy. Yeah. Unless I go to Japan. I'd like to go to Japan for Christmas. That's right. That'd be great. Well, you're okay, we... or you don't know? or oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> You're giving me the, like, I blank stare. I'm like... I won't be here to point this, so if you don't do it... <laughs> no, I don't well, really I'm not going to be in town. <laughs> mm -mm. But the 18th, you think, is okay? Yeah, I, I think so. You think that yeah. worked for you? Yeah, for now, yeah. Okay. All right, good. Do you need a motion, or is it consensus? Uh, yeah, I think we're. That's all right. You're good. All right, I'll let Pam know. Like I said, she's the one who figured it out. Yeah. And town manager's report. Um, just in there that Two Rivers, Cita, Arito Cito at Two Rivers is working on a stormwater grant for us. So um, 
those were the ones that we got in the stormwater management plan through the Better Connections process, grant process. And since we're trying to get infrastructure done before the state repaves, this is obviously a big piece of this. This would also include the town town uh, municipal parking lot, which obviously needs to be repaved as well. So it makes sense to kind of dig it up and do the stormwater process. The other thing um, that the Energy Committee had asked prior was when we do that, at least put a conduit in the ground in case you ever want a charging station. So that way the conduit's there, which makes sense to me as long as it's, how big is this conduit got to be, Dave? Yeah, no Where's it going to go? I was, they asked me to have it put. You know there is two conduits go all the way through that. Parking lot. <laughs> Do you know where? <laughs> I don't know exactly where, but I probably could be close. Yeah, I bet we'll find them. But yeah, that's a good, then we'll find out if they're already there. Then they're, I think they're three inch. Yeah, so I don't know if that's big enough to. Oh, God, yes. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Well, then good, because they had asked that we put it from one of the poles. The blinking one? Yeah, the blinking one. There, They just said, could you put it from one of the poles, not the light poles, but the electric poles, could you put it from one of them over? No. So, I don't know. No. It's what they asked me. Well, they, you, you, so anyways, it's a question. when it comes time. It's a question, not a statement, When it comes Dave. time, Dave, I'll ask you, and we'll figure out, try well, to figure out where before. the two conduits are, and then we just want to make sure they're in the ground, so I don't want to go back and cut up new pavement. You know, I think we said before, soon. if we were to put one in the municipal parking lot, it would have to be right on this left side corner here, because that was where the power would come in. And I don't know where the so, existing right? conduits are. Yeah. But the who we'll connected to Mass the the tra Bank? The, there's the uh, underground box on the other end of the street. It's where you would go with a new conduit. It's on the other side of the parking lot. Yeah. Okay. So it's um, so it's just something to think about. But anyway, so she the application came out. It's due in December. Rita messaged me and said, "Is this something you're interested in?" I said, "Yes, but I can't do it." And she was like, "No problem, we'll do it." So I sent her all the information because DNK did a so what, we want to do Falcon Drive, municipal parking lot, and then there was like a soil separator that would go right up here by the park where um, Lang and Bethel Mills lovingly mows right there. So I just want to look at it to see what we could qualify for. And that would be more of the infrastructure done before they pave. I will, I will suggest that they look really hard at what kind of a charging station they want because you can go anywhere from a $3,000 unit to a $150,000 unit. Yeah. I'm not. That place up in Randolph Center yeah. is crazy. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> interested. I mean, I'm not planning on putting one in in the next couple of years, you know, but what I don't want is to look like a buffoon later because we're cutting up pavement. I think so. you have to assume that you're going to put in, you know, that level one is out. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, yeah. nobody's ever going to use a level one charger, just like the park and ride. I mean, there's a million level one chargers that nobody's ever going to have the patience or the time to plug into. <laughs> so I think if you're going to run a conduit, you have to make sure that the conduit's big enough to yeah. take. You are going to have a level one. You're not going to have a level three. Right. Oh, okay. That's how it works. Okay. I believe level three is 110 volt. You're not going to have one of those. Okay. Because they've got 10 of them down right. here. I think when we talked before, right. that, and I've never seen anybody yeah. ever plugged in. So down we need right. the big one. But anyways, it's just, you know, it's what we talked about was we said over the winter we would look at the Bethel, at the Better Connection stuff and to make some decisions about what you want to do about parking and infrastructure because we're making a run for it knowing that if they're going to repave in 2026, there's some stuff we have to get done not cosmetic, but underground before they come. And um, so that would be a big piece of it would be stormwater and there's funding. So, um, so we'll have to, so that'll be a project that you guys agreed to work on over the winter was looking at the Bethel connection out yeah. front and see what we're going to do next. I would, I would check with um, Maplewood, I think it is up there at 66. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. To see how much money they're making because that's the one you used right that's so do you pay with a credit card like how do you pay, pay? With a, we pay with a credit card pay just like you go with bump i wasn't sure i didn't know it's, it's, well we did that until our charge our unit came for the house okay. and the units don't come with every car when you buy it you have to right green mountain is supplying so, it now 
So there may be people that are going electric and need some place to go, even if it's a level three. All right. But, so yeah. So yeah, once I, we I'm get just, across that bridge, we'll get yeah, there. Yeah. I, the, the, yeah, I just think that that's worth exploring yeah. whether or not a level three ultimately, at the end of the day, pays for itself, even though it's way more expensive, because uh, level one. Is it level one, the good one. Well, Whichever the whichever one whichever the high speed is, whichever the high speed is, is the one not good one mm -hmm. that I would I you know suggest that we at least look at uh, because that's the one that's going to be most useful, especially for people in this town who aren't going to be staying there for eight hours. Right. So you had to use a level two because you don't have a Tesla, and the level one was only a Tesla plug, I, I had believe. A level two in the house. Yeah, because but, that, if you look at the one in Randolph Center, there's yep. two cords that come out of every charger. One is a level one, one's a level two, because oh. the only one, only cars that get to level one is a Tesla plug. Well, but got, that's changing, I, too. Got, no, Ford is changing to, to Tesla's Tesla. plug, Right. but the plug's not changing. Okay. Well, whatever, I was able to charge my car in 45 minutes. Nice. Which is way that's faster than the one at home. I mean, that's at home, Which is a 220 line. Yep. So, um, I, whether it's, I don't know what the level is. <laughs> How long does it take you to charge at home? Just yeah. you know, we'd put it on A couple night. hours. I, it's overnight. It's, it's okay. Very, I'm just curious. I don't, I don't have time to explain it to you, but it's very complicated, these home chargers. Mm -hmm. I put a couple in. It depends on how much power you have in your home. Because I did a guy for a guy down, he has a Tesla, mm -hmm. but it's three hours because he only has 50 amps that he can give me for his charger. Oh, I got it. So you. I have to program the charger so that it doesn't try to charge at 100 amps so it blows the main yeah, breaker. We've, 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 got, we've got 50 <laughs> amp going into the charger at home. Okay, so your oh, charger is derated time-wise because of that. Oh, that right. makes sense. Right, and uh, yeah. Gene suck and drive the power grid on Findlay when he plugs uh, in his car. <laughs> but that's only at night. You know, but <laughs> oh, at, at, at any rate, I just suggest since we'll those are yeah. pay people buy that mm -hmm. <laughs> unless you're you decide as a municipal municipality that's you want to give it away. There's there's a law school has some. What does it cost them or if they're charging? Uh, Green Mountain Power has a bunch, mm -hmm. and they have them inside the building, which um, the employees get to use for free, but the ones you can see are mm -hmm. charged. You have to pay for those. Mm -hmm. uh, Green Mountain Power has them right down here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's not so that I want to install them. I agree with you that years. somebody should do some, some uh, legwork. I'm just saying mm -hmm. I do not want to install one. I have no desire to install one in the next, you know, two years. All I'm saying is if we dig up the parking lot, we need to plan for one. Yeah. That's it. Patrice has no other claws out. Lotto. You and, and do it. Oh, have them do it in the lotto? And then push some of their high-end executives to drive electric cars. Uh -huh. So that they, they could get, but there would also be some evening hours or early morning hours where somebody could go charge. Where, how, I mean, it's out of the way. Yeah. It's a parking lot that's not being used by the public. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can think of five different reasons that would be the perfect place. Yeah. Well, that's a good idea. It's so, anyways, that's all I'm doing is just and maybe they would pay for it in the ground. Program to do only between certain hours. Oh, cool. I didn't know. I had no idea. So that's it for the town manager's report. Um, a lot of meetings this week. Uh, tomorrow, we're with the road crew in the morning. 9 a.m., Richard and I are here for our first project meeting for um, our phase two water project. Um, we have, I have a meeting on Wednesday with Mike Maynard about Sand Hill. We're trying to wrap up some details on that. And then um, Camp Brook, another, bit, another meeting on Friday with them. Hopefully, we are opening bids on the 16th or 17th, so to do the big, big culvert that's going out through Federal Highway. So it's meeting, meeting, meetings this week. Other than that, I think that's it. You're welcome. Okay, meeting minutes from the 25th. Look good to me. 
right, there's Gene. Okay, just need a motion to approve the meeting minutes from September 25th. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I just want to say one thing, and it has nothing to do with anything being wrong, but the next day I, I always look at real estate for sale, and after Greg Martin came and did his thing with Tessie's, I noticed that his building is contingent. Right. Yeah, and I haven't I haven't seen Pam yet to ask her. Um, I don't know how to, you know, if I was just going to ask the realtor if I saw her or if Pam did, but I haven't seen her, so I don't know what the little, deal is yet. Which means he knew that it was there when he came here. Mm -hmm. I believe he did. And the only thing I wonder, the only thing to give somebody a little bit of grace would be to say perhaps they're buying a contingent that he turns it into an apartment. I don't know. Right. Um, so... As soon as we find out, I'll let you know. Yeah, I'm we'll sorry. Send the, we'll send the listers in. Level one is. The oh, that's right. We don't. <laughs> what, <laughs> Dave? Is the, huh? What'd you say? I made a mistake. The level one is the little one. Yeah, level trickle three charger. Is the big one. Okay. Those are useless. Yeah. Level one. Well, yeah. hey. We'll send the listers in. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. We don't have any listers. That's right. Yeah. Youth lab, yeah. Uh -huh. So in the packet was uh, the, out, the Board of Civil Authority made a tax appeal decision. Um, that has been given to the uh, party that appealed, and um, they have put us, I believe, on notice that they're going to go to a state appraiser, which is, which is fine, as is their right. And that's a... Um, not a problem. Yep. All right. Anything else to come before the board? Okay. Hearing none. Lindley, does she say anything? You all sat, Lindley? Just need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. See you later, Lindley. Thanks for the help with the sign. I appreciate it. See you later, Lily. <laughs>